Good evening, everyone. I hope you're ready for a Bible class, so let's just have one. What do you say? Turn to Acts chapter 20, and by now, your Bible should just open to Acts chapter 20. So we'll, we'll go into some other things here about this whole deal tonight, and I trust that those who are not yet coming, ha have not yet come on either, come on or we'll pick this up on the YouTube channel. Figured out last week how many times I've made the exact same error about the YouTube channel, and so um, maybe tomorrow morning I won't make that error this time. Who knows? But um, at any rate, they were, they were about four days getting late getting put on there last week. But we've been talking about how the things changed in the book of Acts, and to our best ability, why, and why we can see the change. And, and a lot of people don't. Um, many people that I believe in talking with them and whatever, I believe that they have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I do not know to what extent they understand grace, and yet I would not call them lost. I might refer to them as, as from time to time as a lost believer, because many people can believe without ever having trusted Christ. So I don't, know, I don't know who I might or might not put into that category. But I know how people react when I tell them, or when I'm in front of them and I, and I say to them how that Christ died for our sins. And then I make some point about he died for every one of them. And then I make some point about he did this 2,000 years ago. How many of your sins were in the future and on and on? And I watched their reaction to that. And for the most part, I don't have any reason to say, well, you're lost to anyone, let alone somebody who's sitting there saying, amen, amen. I agree wholeheartedly agree. I mean, even if all of a sudden there comes a, yeah, but what about this? And what about that? Well, that's wasn't what my dad said. Oh, I've been going to a church that's been sent, saying something contrary to that. Are you sure they're wrong and you're right? I mean, I don't know how many times that's happened in the last 44 years, but several in each case. In each scenario, there are several issues that people bring up, while at the same time they tell you they believe Christ died for all their sins. So I'm not willing to say they're lost and they're, they haven't got a snowball's chance, you know. But I, I don't. By the same token, I don't necessarily say, oh, I know they're saved. They're a brother of mine. No, I'm not going to say that either. If you're sure of your salvation and you make me know that you're sure of your salvation, then I'll call you a brother of mine in Christ. But that don't mean me. I'm not wanting to trade my salvation story for yours. So, as we go through the book of Acts, and some people see things that are in there, and some people don't see things that are obvious to everyone else, you know, you, you sort of scratch your head and say, what's up with this? How can this be corrected? And of course, perhaps it can be corrected. Now, inside of what we call the grace churches, or rightly dividing groups, or whatever it is we might, whatever tag we might put on them, Acts chapter 20 becomes either a settling issue or a bone of contention. Not because it's Acts chapter 20, but because of the things that Paul, the things that are described by Luke that, that he and Paul were doing and others, and the things that Paul had written up till then, and what he then wrote afterwards. Now, most of you that um, hang around here very often, you remember that some time ago, somewhere about two years ago, I put the first books that Paul wrote, like over here, and the last books that Paul wrote, like over here, and I put a bridge in between them, and I said that the bridge was 2 Corinthians. All right. Now, I still believe that. I'm not changing anything about what I believe about that. But I want you to go back in, uh, here in Acts chapter 20. Go back to chapter 20, verse 1. 
He's in, he's in Ephesus. This is very important. He has finished up a three-year stint in Ephesus at this time. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia, which means he was going to go north out of Ephesus, up the coastline to somewhere in the neighborhood of Troas, go across the sea and go into um, above the nation of Greece into the land of Macedonia, which is still there. And most of it is part of Greece, but some of it isn't. Verse 2. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece, which means he came south. And he goes down there, verse 3, and there, when he's down in Greece, and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria, well, if he's going to sail into Syria, he probably was all the way down to the southern part of Greece, which is known as Achaia. It's a peninsula where Corinth is, and he probably was down there. The reason I say this is because there's no other port in order to take a ship going to Syria. There would be no other port in Greece that was, that is, um, what shall I say, used in the Bible, biblical. Uh, notice in verse 4, um, I'm sorry, verse 3, and there abode three months, and when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria, that was his point, that was what he was going to do, here comes the Jews. Keep reading. He purposed to return through Macedonia, which means he's going to try and go back north to Macedonia, go across the sea, probably to Troas from Macedonia. Now look at verse 4. And there, going back up to Macedonia, and there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. These going before tarried for us at Troas. So there's the deal. He's going to go to Troas, go across. Verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days, and upon the first day of the week, and he goes through there, and there, and he's there for a while. Now, it looks like for practically everyone concerned that he wrote Second Corinthians, this bridge, in chapter 20, verse 3, where he abode three months waiting to go on his trips. It could be wrong, but I doubt it. Looks like it's right there. Now, so he goes on and uh, he raises the young men from the dead and so forth there in um, uh, the verse 7 through about verse 12. And then they go to ship. They're going to go now. They're going to go on um, verse 13. And we went before to ship and sailed unto Assos, and there intending to take in Paul, for so he had appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trogilium. And the next day we came to Miletus. Wow. That's moving on. They're doing some stuff there. They really are. And then he stops. Verse. Now, I don't know why it would have been better here. If you look at a map, you find very little reason to wonder, or very little, little, little reason that you have concluded. First, Paul, the thing to do is to get to Miletus, and then you call these guys. It does, it's just, it's like the, all, all of these places there, from the time that he had to turn around and go north, go across and come down, it's, it's, like, it's like from the time of the first part of that, he could have called for the elders at Ephesus, to a half dozen of these places, and it wouldn't have been much of more out of their way. And yet he does, he waits to get to Miletus, which tells me that this concern that is making him call the leaders of, of Ephesus to him, to himself, that it probably took a lot of prayer, forethought, pondering over it, using the scriptures as he knew them, 
And by the way, let me remind you what he knew primarily. Paul, not only did he know the Old Testament, he understood the bulk of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and I don't know whether it was all four of them, but probably three uh, of these letters. He probably knew a lot about three of those. And he would have known James, the book of James. He would have known the book of Hebrews. He would have known for sure First Peter, and he might have known Second Peter too at this time. I'm not sure about that. I, deep down, I don't think that. Uh, he would have known First John. Now, when he and, and so then he write or then he he writes Second Corinthians, and then is compelled to call the the Ephesian elders. unto himself. I'm not trying to make a bigger thing out of this than it is. This is a huge event. Now we've gone about, we've gone over this several weeks. We've talked about several different aspects of it. And yet we haven't talked about the biggie as far as I'm concerned. Notice in verse 17, and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons. Well, the first day he came into Asia was when, is in Acts chapter 13, verse 4, when he went to Sicily. And from there into Galatia. And that's Asia. That's where he was. He says, you know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons. So what did he do? He went to all of those towns in Galatia. Then he went to Jerusalem. Then he brings back the, uh, the uh, four ordinances for to keep and ordained them in every, in every church where he'd been before. And he winds up in Corinth, and then back over to Ephesus, back to Asia. So I've got these books here. In the first books that Paul wrote, he know, Paul knows all this scripture, the Old Testament, James, Hebrews, 1 Peter, John, most of the gospel there. Then he also, he just finished writing the book of Romans and the book of 2 Corinthians. So he's got 1 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians, real fresh in his mind, and in Galatians, and First and Second Thessalonians. Those are the things that were written before he said these words. Did you get me? Paul wrote these things and knew these things before he said to these guys, you know. From the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons. And he's saying they understood. He's saying, I know you understood. That's what he's saying. Well, now look, he starts reminding them of things, and he does a lot of it. So let's just read it. The only other way to get through it is to read it. He says, I was, verse 19 serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the deal. Every time you turn around, some denominationalist wants to use the word repentance against you because you've told him that you don't need to repent of your sins. Well, you don't need to repent of your sins. However, repentance toward God means you change your mind about God. And Paul preached unto them how to change their mind about God. He said to the Thessalonians, you turn to God from idols. Well, that's, that's repenting toward God, is it not? And many things like that went on during all of this period of time. So now, now think about what he's saying to them is, that I taught you both 
publicly and from house to house. I taught you repentance toward God. Jews and Greeks both. I taught you repentance toward God, and I taught you faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of his testimony. Paul telling these people that as the first time they met him, he tells them about the road to Damascus. He tells them about the Lord saying, go into Damascus, and it'll be to told you what you're going to do. Ananias coming to him and not only uh, laying hands on him so he'll receive his sight, but also baptizing him in the same manner that Peter and James and John were baptized. Think about that. Now notice, when he, uh, the, this, is, this is the thing he's reminding these people of. This is what he taught them. And he says, uh, verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. In other words, he then tells them his state of affairs. That's what he's doing. That's what's up. What's up? There you go. That's what's up. So when he, when he does this, he reiterates to them why he is what he is and how he is what he is. Notice verse 24. <clears throat> but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. I know a whole bunch of people that are right now tuned into this screen and more who will be tuned into this screen who can't say that. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. I don't, I'm not trying to build a, a, um, a, a set pole up on top of some pedestal here. I'm not doing that. That's not what this is about anyway. But I want you to understand the difference between the way Paul and these Ephesians were in A.D. 60 or thereabouts versus the way we are today. And I'm going to bring this up more than once here tonight. The way we are today, think about it. Do you know what I did last week? I got so frustrated at my house last week that I spent $3,300 to get a new air conditioner. Ain't that something? How many places do you suppose Paul and his company stayed which had central air conditioning? You see what I mean? We don't live like this. We're not back there, and we ought not try to get ourselves back there. Don't do that. You're not back there. You're over here. Now, I'm pretty sure that, probably, that point just kind of uh, it may seem a little... Uh, uh, irony or, or, uh, or useless to you. I don't know about that. But don't let that be useless to you. Most people think that they're like the Christians of the first century. No, you're not. You're not anywhere close to it. Most people who rightly divide think that they're like the Christians after Acts chapter 9, from Acts chapter 9 on. Why, they're Christians called, uh, people called Christians first in Acts chapter 11. That was us. That was nowhere near us. Acts chapter 13, 14, he started 10 churches. Those churches were not like you and me. Acts 15, carry ordinances for those churches to be ordained by and established with? Are you kidding me? You can't find an ordinance you need to be established with. See, I'm talking to grace-believing people who are afraid to say that there's a difference today between today and Acts chapter 15. You know you're not like that. You don't know anybody who lives with the way that Christians lived in Acts 15, 16, 17, 18. You don't know anybody like that. Quit saying you do. And three years in Ephesus, well, there was a point in Ephesus where he had the whole town interested in burning all their witchcraft books. I bet you I'm talking to somebody right now that believes they're a, like a first century Christian and you go to uh, Walt Disney World, which is filled with witchcraft. Take your grandkids there. Go down and play. Have a good time. Talk to a, a Pentecostal couple yesterday morning. 
they're gonna they were in Martinsville, Indiana, which is where I was, and they were they were going to go to church with their cousins, and they're going to meet their grandchildren there, and then they're going to fly them down to Orlando and take them to Walt Disney World. Pentecostals. They believe they're like the people in Acts chapter 2, and they're going down there to Walt Disney World. I don't care who goes to Walt Disney World and has a good time, but for crying out loud, don't act like you're a first century Christian doing it. They wouldn't have done it. They were warned against it for crying out loud. And in Ephesus, they burned all of their books, piled it all up, did away with their witchcraft. The Thessalonians turned from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for Jesus Christ. Come on, we don't do any of that stuff. We're living in too much grace. We like the grace too much to do all that stuff. We're not Acts chapter 20 Christians. We're not Acts chapter 16 Christians. We're not Acts chapter 13 Christians or 11. And we ought to quit pretending that we are. Accept what we are. Accept what the Lord called us into and from. Now, Notice, if you will, in, in, again in verse 24, but none of these things move me. The fact that Paul was going to die or might die or something was going to hurt him didn't bother him at all. Uh, I believe he withstood a little bit of non-air-conditioned comfort, don't you? None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy. Now there's a great picture of the difference between comfort happiness, and joy, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I've received with the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, out here over this blank, I'm going to put testimony to, I'm sorry, the testimony of gospel of the grace of God. Paul has been showing people salvation by grace for almost for about 25 years when he said that. And yet he has not testified the gospel of the grace of God yet. At this time, in Acts chapter, 20, uh, Acts chapter 20, A.D. 60 or so, he's talking to the elders from Ephesus, and he has not testified the gospel of the grace of God yet. That's what he just said, verse 25. And now, behold, I know that you all, among whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. In other words, what Paul had told them was about all of this back here, about all of this right here and the Jews in relationship to all of this which he had written down. Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, 1 2 Thessalonians. That's what he written down. So he says unto them, he said, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He did not say, I've told you everything. That wasn't what he said. He said, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. If you'll notice, the companion passage is verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. So a lot of people wonder, well, what else did he know? I, I'm not sure I know all that he knew, but I know what else he knew which became Scripture because I've got it. Because you see, over here in this blank space, I know about the last seven books that go in here, and it has to do with Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. 
And when he wrote 2 Timothy, which was last, he said he was done. Here he said that I might finish my course with joy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, I finished my course. Then he said, all the revelation that the Lord wanted in his word. And somewhere between Acts chapter 20 and when he got to prison and began to write these, the other books of the Bible, God written, and I think I've got them all up there, but three or four, Jude and second and third John and Revelation. Now, so in Acts chapter 20, he's going to leave these people, and he's told them here in uh, uh, verse 25 that they're not going to see him anymore. He ain't coming back, in other words. Now, I know by Romans where he intended to go. I know by the book of Acts where he actually went. But to these people, he told them he wasn't coming back. Verse 28, he, so he says to them, and this is a big warning. He says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, elders of the church at Ephesus, to feed the church of God. Well, let me tell you something. Paul had been feeding the church of God since Acts chapter 11. And now he tells these guys, feed the church of God. Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the, Lord, the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. And he says the reason to do so is to feed the church of God. And he says of that church, he says, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, just a little side note, and it won't take long. Here's the deal. The blood of God Almighty the untainted blood of God Almighty flowed through the veins of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, conceived of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, he had the blood of his father in him. A mother nurtures the blood that was given to her by the father. That's how babies get born. And... God Almighty's blood was in Jesus Christ's veins, and God purchased the church by the shedding of his own blood through Jesus Christ. Now, that's a great point about that verse. So just latch on to that, and you will, you'll, you'll appreciate, the longer you study the blood of Jesus Christ, the more you'll appreciate that verse. Verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, and not sparing the flock, and also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. You know something? The people who interpret rather than believe what it reads are always doing that, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. There are several things you should know about that. If what I teach about Acts chapter 20, and therefore, then, what I teach about these last seven books, accompanied by the bridge of 2 Corinthians, if that seems different to you, don't examine what I preach on the basis of what you believe. Examine what I preach about this on the basis of the words on the page. As Brother Moore used to say, now, we're just going to believe what we read. <laughs> so now he says things people he says here in verse 29 and 30 he says people are going to want to change this somebody's going to want this not to be heard well bless your soul they did a remarkable job of keeping most of this stuff hidden right in plain sight for about 1850 years uh, they did you know, somebody will say, when did this grace movement stuff start? Say, with the Apostle Paul. Well, but I mean, when did it start? With the Apostle Paul. Yeah, but when did it start around here? With the Apostle Paul. But you see, they won't let you do that. They say, well, who's the first one you ever knew of? 
And it's true, most of that goes back, not all of it. Some of it goes all the way back to Coverdale, but most of it goes back to the uh, 19th century. And I'll tell you why that is. This, this, just, this is not scripture, this is just Jerry's opinion. In the 19th century, cults, which have become huge today, many of them got started. And many men who were Bible scholars, including some Baptist preachers, several Baptist preachers, several non-denominational preachers, in the 19th century, they began to study the Bible so as to not be swallowed up by the uh, cult-like activities of people like Christian Science, Seventh-day Adventist, um, Mormons, and on and on it goes. That's all 19th century stuff. And they, so there were some Bible teachers who they pushed this out. They said, look, here's what, look here what this says. And some of them, you've heard their names. Some of them were Baptist preachers like Clarence Larkin uh, and um, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. People say, oh, Haddon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon didn't believe what we believe. No, he didn't, but he believed a lot more than the regular run-of-the-mill denominational church believed. And of course, there's Darby, Sir Robert Anderson, all these men are just men, and they made errors. I, I can't believe what Darby did to Scripture. And yet, he saw things in the Scripture that most denominationalists didn't see. And Sir Robert Anderson did a magnificent job on the prophecy of Daniel, and yet if you read the books he wrote about the prophecy of Daniel, he, like any of the rest of us, would do. To, he inserted some thoughts of his own. It's not Scripture. It might make you drive you back into the scripture, and that would be good. That's what study aids are for, to drive you back into the book. And then besides Claire Slark, and then there was C.I. Schofield, who was a lying, cheating, sneaking lawyer and got saved and began to write a commentary on the Bible. And he saw lots of truth that other people couldn't see. And Bulliger and others like them. And somebody's always trying to accuse a rightly dividing person of following one of these historic figures. Bless your soul, if it's you, quit it and pick up the Bible and start following what the Scripture says. So, always there's these wolves entering in among you, and some will come from your own groups. So he warns these people. Now, it was with them three years. They knew him well. He's already told them he's not going to see them anymore. Now watch this. He says, verse 31, he says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more, and they accompanied him unto the ship. Now, he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to go land at, uh, um, at I think it's at Caesarea, uh, or Phoenicia maybe, and he's going to go to Jerusalem. And we're going to get into that more next week. But right now, we've got these words he spoke to these Ephesian elders, and we're going to make some comparisons with the words which he wrote in the book of Ephesians. So go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll start reading in verse 3. And yes, I know about verse 1, and, um, and I'll come back to that later. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, 
before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he, God, hath made us accepted in the beloved, the beloved being Jesus Christ. Here's how you know, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Wherein? In the riches, in the redemption we have in Christ Jesus, in the uh, riches of his grace. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. And you can go with the mystery of his will and go talk for an hour about that if you want to. Verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Wait a minute now. In the dispensation of the fullness of times, the Lord is going to have a manner in which he can gather together all things in Christ. And then he says, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And then he includes himself, in whom, in whom also we have an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. Well, well, well. Now, right there is a great division that is going to be brought together by this bridge. Right there, you just read about we who first trusted in Christ, and he read about ye who also trusted in Christ. And the thing that Paul says about the we who first trusted and the ye who also trusted is that now you can be gathered together. So where'd you get that? I got it out of verse 10. And in verse 11, he started, he began to include himself and these Ephesians. Wow. So well, that's no big deal. That's what he's been doing all along. No, it's not what he's been doing. Why would he say that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ is set in contrast to in whom ye also trusted. Here's why. He has to, in the writing of this narrative about the doctrine which these people knew, um, needed to know from him, he has to make this division. You know why? Because of two verses later. So pick up in verse 12 again and read with me straight through that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, now, right there, there's a whole gob of rightly dividing people who believe that this back here, the, the blue, is the same as this over here and the red, and that there's no real difference in them. They leave you. He says right here, I didn't know you. He says, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord. We just read about the weeping and crying of the people in Ephesus. They knew him quite well. He was with them for three years, but he wasn't with these people. Don't you dare make him be with these people. He was not with these people. Likewise, look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. Verse 3, 
we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. He never even went to Colossae. He didn't know these people. He was telling these people, like he was telling the Ephesians in the book of Ephesians, he was telling these people something new that they didn't know. Well, he was at Ephesus for three years. He was at Corinth for a year and a half. He was in Galatia about 11 years. And twice or three times he was in Thessalonica and sent Timothy back there twice. And he wrote, he had, Aquila and Priscilla going over to Rome. He wrote them the longest of the letters, and on and on it goes. Hey, folks, all of these doctrines right back here, all of these things back here are not the same as these over here. He wouldn't be saying these kinds of words. Go back to Ephesians 1. Never, never, in Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, or in um, Philippians or to any of the pastorals, never does he say what he says in verse 10 and 11 here. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the working uh, purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will that we should be the praise that's going on. He didn't say those kinds of things in the other books. You know why? He couldn't. He couldn't. Hold on to Ephesians chapter 1 and go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I mean, I mean, I don't know what he knew, but I know that he couldn't say them. He couldn't. And remember, a while ago I said, I don't know what all Paul's, I mean, it's, it, it's hard to write down a narrative of what somebody says in speech after speech after speech. It's hard to do that. I appreciate people, there's, uh, on two or three different occasions, I've had people that transcribed my message. They wrote down the very things that I said. Now, that had to be the most boring, laborious job you could ever think of to do. But look how, look how many words you would pile up if you kept doing that week after week after week. And look how, relatively speaking, how small the Word of God is. So I don't know everything that Paul knew. I know what became Scripture, though. I got that. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says in verse 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. I'm sorry, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So when Paul wrote 2 Corinthians, this bridge, when he wrote this, he could not say all the words. And it's Paul. You can see there in a moment or two. He couldn't, he couldn't say all those words. They were unspeakable. It was not lawful for him to utter them. So what are we going to do with them? We're going to read what Paul said about them. Verse 5. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, which means hold back, do without. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Wow. So Paul was going to say things in the future, which he had not said at this particular time and couldn't say. And it looks as though he might have wanted to, but the thorn in the flesh reminded him not to. He said, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. If he had told everything, 
he would have gotten exalted. Now, I'll tell you what people do today with that. They pay no, they pay no attention to whether or not there's any thorns in their flesh. <laughs> you know, there is a great big movement. Been going on, this is not new, been going on for several centuries. But it's get, it gets bigger every now and then, and it's bigger right now than it has been in probably the last 25 years, and that is the presentation, if you will, that when Christ died for the sins of the world, that from there on, no one was lost. I just read a, a question was given on a Facebook column by a young preacher do you really know you're going to heaven when you die? And someone answered, everybody is. Think about it. Everybody is. <laughs> Everybody's got an inheritance, but it ain't all going to heaven. Now, my point about all this is that Paul had more to say here, and he said, I will say it. There's coming a day when I say it. So it builds this bridge from all of the things which he has said back here in these six books, including the book, the book I'm calling a bridge, to the things he's going to say over here in these seven books. He has to build a way to get these people to see this. And he did. And when we go back to studying 2 Corinthians again, which is one of my favorite books, we'll probably see even more things than we've seen in the past. But right now, we're looking at the book of Acts and how to uh, amazingly get out of Acts chapter 20. But what, go back to 1 Corinthians, uh, I'm sorry, go back to Ephesians chapter 1 again. He says in verse 15, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. So when he included these people as having also trusted Christ in verse 13, he is saying that to them because he heard of their faith in Christ Jesus. Did you get that? Not because he knows them. He didn't know them. The ones he knew, he knew they were the elders. He, he put them in charge of things, etc. He knew they were saved. He knew their testimony. He didn't know these guys' testimony. Okay? Now, look in chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he, that'll be God, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So if you go to, in your own mind, you go to the world in general and see the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, then you're going to understand that there's some people there that are lost. He says, in time past, you walked that way. Well, the time past would have to be prior to them hearing the word of truth, the gospel, their salvation, believing it, trusting Christ as their Savior, and being sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That's the time past, wherein in time past, you walked according to the course of this world. He's not talking to a bunch of people here that, that um, have just come on the scene. He's talking to a bunch of people here who have gotten saved. See what I mean? They're not strangers now. They are saved people now. Keep reading. Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. You see, in verse 3, he puts himself as having come from time past out of the same kind of group as these people who walked in time past according to the course of this world. And so he says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, and that would be Paul himself, the we of verse 3, and the ye, all these Ephesians that he's writing this letter to. 
But God is rich in mercy for his great love with, her, uh, with he loved us. Now watch carefully. Even when we were dead in sins, stop right there and go back and read Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. And notice this. Romans over here, first group book. Same people, same attitude, same purpose, same God, same Savior. Verse 6, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the who? Ungodly. Verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died when? While they were yet sinners. <clears throat> verse, <clears throat> verse 10, for if when we were enemies. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. How did the world get reconciled to God by the death of his son? When they were enemies. They're reconciled. God not mad at them anymore. Okay? Same kind of thing he's telling these Ephesians had happened to them. Go back to Ephesians 2 now. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, God hath quickened us together with Christ. Bingo. You just, all of a sudden, you just hit a whoops. Whoops. There's a parenthesis there. And it says, by grace we are saved. Is that what it said? Did I say that right? Did it say by grace we are saved? No. It said by grace ye are saved. He, excuse me. He taught these people they were saved by grace. Yes, he did. But not the same way these Ephesians were saved by grace, because right here in this passage, he determined by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God, and by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he determined that by grace ye are saved has to be separated by what we call a parenthesis. I didn't make that up. I didn't, I didn't make up the rules of grammar. I didn't make up punctuation. And a parenthesis separates the we from the ye. You can't help that. It separates the we from the ye. It just, it does. <clears throat> Keep reading and hath raised us up together. All of a sudden, us and ye are back together. And, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. There we are again, all of us. Through Christ Jesus, watch. For by grace are ye saved. He did it again. He did it again. If there wasn't anything to this, why would it be in two verses? The Ephesians that he's writing this book to were not saved with the same gospel, yes. With the same blood of Jesus Christ, yes. With the same completeness in Christ, yes. But how did they get saved? They got saved in spite of who and what they were. They got saved in spite of the fact that they had no uh, uh, association with anyone else who was saved. You can walk up to an individual on the street today and say, Christ died for your sins, was buried, God raised him from the dead for your justification, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that what Jesus Christ did for you and you'll be saved. Go on down the street, that man could go in buy himself two big bottles of booze, get stinking drunk, go home, wake up the next morning, and say, I have to trust Christ as my Savior. And be saved. Tell me now, could you do that in the book of Acts? No, you couldn't do that in the book of Acts. <laughs> but you can right now. From Acts chapter 11 to Acts chapter 20, the people who got saved 
heard the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, and they believed it. But they were in certain places, under certain circumstances, listening to certain issues, issues being brought out of the scriptures in order for them to see how they could get saved. Did they work for their salvation? Absolutely not. Were they in the company of people who worked for their salvation? Absolutely not. I mean, not the saved people. Did they get saved because of their association? No. Did they need the association to get saved? No. They needed the association to hear the gospel. These Ephesians didn't. Paul didn't even, he, he makes no mention whatsoever of who preached the gospel to these people. You know, I've often thought about that, the way he commended people and their, and their work in the ministry in many, many places. And I thought, okay, but he never did that for anyone who taught these people about the gospel of Christ, the power of God under their salvation. The word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, how that Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for all. He never, he never ever commends anyone for teaching these Ephesians or the Colossians, although he commends a couple of guys in Colossae for being there and working there, but not, not the initial preaching, not the evangel evangelical preaching. It's not there. Well, obvious, he's not as, right now, he's not got this explained yet. I mean, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For, ye, for we, back to all of us, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now watch. Wherefore, remember that ye, ye, these Ephesians, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, time past, Gentiles in the flesh, that at that time ye were without Christ, comma, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. A lots of people I know don't want that phrase to be there. And even the ones who say, oh, no, no, that's got to be there, they don't really like it. Because, you see, these guys that Paul's writing to, they weren't like the Ephesians of Acts 19, where he spent three years with them. They weren't like the Corinthians, where he spent 18 months with them. They weren't like the Thessalonians, or the Bereans, or the Amphipolonians, or the first group of the Philippians, and on. I mean, they weren't, they weren't like them. Those people were sitting in synagogues, Berea, synagogues. All those churches in Galatia, synagogues. Now look, he says, again, he says that at that time you were without Christ. Here's how they were without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was their condition. Well, let's see. If you look at Galatians chapter 3. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3, it's about whether or not they should have any law. And, it, and Paul's showing them there's no law in law. He says, oh, foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you, and on and on. Now look down, if you will, in verse 26. For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. There's anything changed about that today. That's still exactly the same. Now watch this. And if you be Christ, that is if you're saved, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? Did he say that they were heirs according to the promise? Did he say they were heirs according to the promise? Yes. Well, it's because you're, they, he, people say, well, it's because they're saved. Well, of course it's because they're saved. That's how they know they got the promises. You got any promises? I'll flip back over to Ephesians 2. Third phrase in verse 12. Strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope. If these people were sitting in a synagogue, 
and Paul preached the gospel of Christ to them, did they have a hope? Yes, they did. How, do, how did they know they had a hope? Because they were doing what it took to be an heir according to the promise. Go back to Galatians, look in Galatians 4. In Galatians 4. Verse 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, that would be the new Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven, right? Jerusalem, which is above. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. That would be the heirs, according to the promise, accounted as Abraham's seed in, ver in chapter 3, verse 29 whether Jew or Greek, bond or free, male or female, they were heirs according to the promise which made Jerusalem, which is above, their mother. And look at verse 28. Now we, Paul and the Galatian people, now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Let's go back over to Ephesians chapter 2 and let's look again. Let's make sure we're reading this correctly. Verse 12. That at that time, the time past, of uh, verse 11, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You can't make these Ephesians who are saved by the gospel of Christ and by the gospel of the grace of God. You can't make them be like the Galatians who were saved by the gospel of Christ. They're not like them. You ain't like them. You're not like, you're like these Ephesians. You're not like the Galatians. You're not like the Romans, the Galatians, the Corinthians, the Thessalonians, the Bereans. You're not like them. Any Okans? You're not like them. And you know you're not. Well, I suspect that within somewhere within the last 48 hours, everybody that will ever hear me talking about this has done something in violation of those four little ordinances of Acts 15. Just think about it. Back in Ephesians 2. He says in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, another great but now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Notice it's the same blood shed. It's the same sacrifice. It's the same cross of Calvary. For he is our peace who have made both one and has broken down the middle wall partition between us. And all of a sudden there comes a great big argument about who the both is. We settled that back in chapter one. Why would it have changed between chapter 1, we who first trusted in Christ and ye who also trusted, why would that change just because we're over in chapter 2, verse 14? There's no change. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having, and here's how he did that, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. Now, in these six books, the church, the body of Christ, is never spoken of as a she or a he. In Ephesians, the church, the body of Christ, is spoken of as a he, and, by the way, just in sort of a superimposing thing here, Think of it in terms of perfect. Perfect. In Christ Jesus, perfect. Perfect man. Now notice again, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, these who first trusted in Christ, ye who also trusted, one new Man, so making peace. Over in chapter 4, chapter 4, 
of the gifts given to men and what they're for. There are evangelists, pastors, and teachers, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Folks, I don't think I made anything up. I didn't get quite as far as I wanted to in Ephesians and Colossians, but I hope I made you understand in Ephesians some of the things that he was drawing out, um, uh, drawing a picture of in Acts chapter 20, where he had ridden the bridge and he's talking to those uh, Ephesian elders. Now, one more thing, and then I'll shut up about this tonight. Look in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word. Now there is the picture of the gospel of the grace of God. Now there is a dispensation that is called the dispensation of the grace of God. I once was asked by a preacher who doesn't believe this separation and this rejoining thing like I do. He said, when do you think the grace dispensation started? And I said, well, grace dispensation started when Paul said there was one. He said, you mean if he didn't say it, it wasn't one? I said, well, yeah, that is what I mean. He just poo-pooed that and laughed away and just took, took it away. He just didn't have any more to say. But think about what he, what, he, what he was saying there, and I just changed microphone so it may sound a little different to you. This one just went bad. So what was, he say, what was I saying there? I was saying that there was no dispensation of the grace of God until Paul said there was one. I make no, no uh, apology for that. I absolutely believe that. There was no dispensation of the grace of God until Paul said there was a dispensation of the grace of God. Think about it. The word dispensation is used four times in Scripture, and Paul used all four of them. He talks about the dispensation of the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 because he started the dispensation of the gospel in Acts chapter 9, and he tells them what I, he says, this is what I've been preaching to you. Well, the dispensation of the grace of God was not known in Acts chapter 20. He said, I'm going to go testify the gospel of the grace of God. He hadn't testified the gospel of the grace of God yet. He had testified the gospel of Christ. People say, what's well, the same gospel? It is the same words of the gospel, but not to whom it went. We who first trusted in Christ, heirs according to the promise. Ye who also trusted, keep reading. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. I got this dispensation I'm giving to you, he says. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, having to do with telling somebody that there was a dispensation of the grace of God. As I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Well, in the only few words written afore to these Ephesians is chapter 1 and chapter 2. I've suggested to some folks that the reason they don't see what I'm talking about here is because they don't know what chapter 1 and chapter 2 says. Well, study it. We're trying to rewrite it to match uh, Romans and Corinthians, Galatians, and Thessalonians. Don't do that. Read it for what it says. Chapter 3, verse 5. This knowledge of the myth that Paul understood, the things he understood about the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets, watch, by the Spirit, not by the Scripture, not by a promise made to Abraham. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, not the Gentiles and the Jews be fellow heirs, that the Gentiles be fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers of his, that's God's promise in Christ, watch, by the gospel, not by a, a, a promise that God made to Abraham, by the gospel. 
The gospel of Christ, the power of God and salvation has become the gospel of the grace of God to the entire world, no differences. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And the reason he had to preach it to the Gentiles is because they couldn't search it out. It's unsearchable and he preached it to us. Verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Not make all men see the mystery. Make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God. Not hid in the scriptures, hid in God. Who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers uh, in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. And that, so along with a couple of other things, is what we're going to talk about next week. What is it that needs to be made known? I thank you all for being here, and I hope that this has been helpful, not a hindrance. And I hope that uh, you all have uh, a great uh, week. And uh, if you are listening to this on uh, the YouTube channel, uh, you, you may know it by now, but you can call me, ask me questions, talk to me about this. I, if I don't give you a Bible answer, then that, that's my fault. That, that's not your fault. That's my fault. So I thank you all for being here. I'm going to stop the recording now, and those of you who are on here live, we can discuss this all night if you want to.